The history of equal work for equal pay in Britain can be traced back at least as far as the 1830s. The first piece of legislation on equal pay was the 1970 Equal Pay Act which came into force in 1975. Section 1, subsection 1a. For men and women employed on like work, terms and conditions of one sex are not in any respect less favourable than those of the other hand to be. For men and women employed on work rate is equivalent, terms and conditions of one sex are not less favourable than those of the other in any respect in which the terms and conditions of both are determined by the rating of their work. Section 1, subsection 2. It shall be a term of the contract under which a woman is employed at an establishment in Great Britain that she shall be given equal treatment with men in the same employment. The Dagenham sewing machinists uh, strike of the late 1960s was one of the things that led to the Equal Pay Act 1970. In 1968, female sewing machinists at the Ford plant in Dagenham went on strike over pay. They were responsible for making car seat covers and ultimately their action completely halted car production at the plant. The strike is regarded as one of the triggers for the creation of the Act, but it's also worth noting that the UK would have needed to bring its legislation into line with Article 119 of the 1957 Treaty of Rome in accordance with its membership of the European Community in any case. Statute of Rome, Article 119. Each member state shall ensure and subsequently maintain the application of the principle that men and women should receive equal pay for equal work. The events were dramatised in the movie Made in Dagenham, uh, which came out within the last few years. Employers also have a defence to claims of unequal pay. Section 2, subsection 6. Where a woman ought to be, or to have been, given equal treatment with a man as required by her equal pay clause, and he enjoys, or has enjoyed by comparison with her, any greater remuneration or other advantage, then it shall be for the woman's employer to show that this advantage is not the result of his terms and conditions of employment being in any respect more favourable than hers, but is genuinely due to a material difference, in brackets other than the difference of sex between her case and his. Section 2, subsection 6 of the 1970 Act contained what has come to be known as the Material Factor Defence. The 1970 Act has since been repealed by Parliament, but the law was transferred in broadly similar terms to Part 5, Chapter 3 of the Equality Act 2010. Much of the case law decided under the old Act is still relevant today. Scotland. The Scottish case of Rainey versus Greater Glasgow Health Board was one such case. Elizabeth Rainey was employed by Greater Glasgow Health Board as a prosthetist, somebody responsible for the fitting of artificial limbs. She was employed at the Belvedere Hospital in Glasgow. Her complaint was that she was not being paid as much as male colleagues, who had the same skill set and level of qualification and were performing the same job. In such cases, the complainant will use a comparator of the opposite sex employed in like work by the employer to prove their case. Elizabeth Rainey chose a Mr. Alan Crumlin as her comparator. Alan Crumlin was also a prosthetist employed by Belvedere Hospital in the same role as Elizabeth Rainey. Elizabeth Rainey had been employed on a starting salary of £4,773 and was earning £7,295 at the time of the tribunal hearing.
Alan Crumlin had been employed around the same time and a starting salary of £6,680, which at the time of the tribunal hearing had risen to £10,085. Mr Crumlin was one of 20 other male prosthetists employed on similar wages. This housing estate stands close to the site of the old Belvedere Hospital, which has since been demolished. In spite of these large differences in pay, Elizabeth Ramey's claim failed. The employer successfully used the material fact of defence. Lord Keith of Kinkell, speaking in that case, said, In 1979, the Secretary of State for Scotland decided to establish a prosthetic fitting service within the National Health Service in Scotland, and to discontinue the arrangement under which the service was provided by private contractors. It was decided by the Scottish Home and Health Department that, in general, the remuneration of employees on the new prosthetic service should be related to the Whitley Council scale, and that the appropriate scale for them would be that of medical physics technicians. Since, however, it was appreciated that this might not be attractive to the prosthetists in the employment of private contractors whom it was desired to recruit on block, it was decided to offer them an option. That option, as set out in a letter from the department to Mr Crumlin dated 11th of January 1980, was either to come into the National Health Service on National Health Service rates of pay and conditions of service, or to remain on the rates of pay and conditions of service which he presently received, subject to future changes as negotiated by his trade union, ASTMS, for the prosthetists employed by contractors. Mr Crumlin and all the other prosthetists who received the offer, about 20 in number, who all happened to be men, opted for the second alternative. This meant that they retained their existing salaries, and that future increases were to be negotiated with ASTMS and not the Whitley Council. He was paid more because of the necessity to attract him and other privately employed prosthetists into forming the nucleus of the new service. The employer was held not to have discriminated against Elizabeth Rainey. The difference in pay was not due to her sex, but due to the fact that the prosthetists the NHS needed to recruit from the private sector were earning a higher wage there, which had been negotiated through their union. The prosthetists the NHS needed it just happened to be men, and were not being paid more based on this factor. Another case involving the material fact of defence is Ratcliffe versus North Yorkshire County Council. This car was definitely not made in Dagenham. The three appellants in this case were catering assistants employed at schools across North Yorkshire. Mrs Crosby was employed at Archbishop Holgate Secondary School in York. Mrs Collinson was employed at First County Primary School and Mrs Ratcliffe was employed at Malton Secondary School. They used various comparators including a Mr Ostwick who worked as a Weybridge attendant at the Seamer Car Waste Disposal Site. In 1989, the council was required to engage in competitive tendering. Many service providers had to offer their services on the basis of reduced costs. In order to reduce costs, the council made the claimants redundant and then re-employed them on lower pay and on more unfavourable conditions than they had previously been on. The paying conditions of the male comparators remained the same. The council argued that the need to work competitively was a material factor which justified lower rates of pay for the women. tribunal disagreed. It is clear that both the DSO and the employees were over the proverbial barrel due to the fact that the competitors only employed women and because of that employed them on less favourable terms than the council did previously under the NJC agreement. That may well have been a material factor but it was certainly a material factor due to the difference of sex arriving out of the general perception in the United Kingdom and certainly in North Yorkshire that a woman should stay at home to look after the children. And if she wants to work, it must fit in with that domestic duty and a lack of facilities to enable her easily to do otherwise. The House of Lords agreed with the tribunal. The women could not have found other suitable work and were obliged to take the wages offered if they were to continue with this work. The fact is that the employer re-engaged the women at rates of pay less than those received by the male comparators and no material difference, other than a difference of sex, has been found to exist between the cases of the women and the male comparators. The tribunal had further stated the House of Lords agreeing with them. 
Indeed, that workforce would not be able, because of family commitments, to easily take on any overpaid employment, particularly in the large rural areas that dominate North Yorkshire. It was clear to Mr Tilbrook that it was a workforce that would, by and large, continue to do the work, even at a reduced rate of pay, when the alternative was no work or ceasing to have the advantages of remaining a county council employee and becoming an employee of a commercial catering organisation and doing the same work for less favourable terms in any event.